With a little more than a week until Iowans decide their choice for the 2012 Republican nominee, Ron Paul continues to enjoy strong support there, and other GOP contenders are taking aim. Looking to derail Texas Congressman Ron Paul in the first in the nation caucus, state rival campaigns plan to air fresh TV ads and hit the phones to persuade undecided caucus goers. All of the talk about the Ron Paul surge and the support that he has out there, the momentum that he has potentially going into these January 3rd caucuses is real. Ron Paul wins the Iowa caucuses. Well, heaven forbid. I was governor going so far as to say that if the Texas congressman wins, ignore it and look at who finishes second. My own colleague, Chris Wallace, says if Ron Paul takes Iowa, it discredits the state's caucuses. Bill O'Reilly says Paul can't win the nomination, even if he does win the Iowa caucuses. Juan Williams says, well, he's unelectable. Bill Crystal says he's unelectable. And scores of Republican state party chairmen across the country say Ron Paul is unelectable. They fear the better Paul does, the worse the party's chances next fall look. Well, then get ready, guys, because I could be wrong, but I think Ron Paul does win the Iowa caucuses and does unleash all this ridiculous paranoia all over again. And for what? On the notion that as the Texan gathers heat, he sends his party down in flames? Didn't they say the same about another Iowa sensation named Jimmy Carter in 1976, arguing he would send his party down to defeat against an otherwise very defeatable Jerry Ford? He didn't or Ronald Reagan against a supposedly vastly more electable George Bush Sr. That no way in heck he could beat Jimmy Carter in 1980. He did. History is full of candidates who couldn't make it but did. And sure shots for whom the White House was theirs, but in the end, apparently was not. Now, I'm not here as a supporter of Ron Paul, but as an opponent of anyone dismissing Ron Paul or anyone else at this stage. They're all due a fair hearing, not an unfair clearing. Now, if Ron Paul does surprise, don't blame it on average voters who didn't see it coming. Blame it on haughty media pundits who continued dismissing him, even as he did. We in my business have an obligation to shut up on this stuff and give them their due, give you their vote. Then, I, I really get a kick out of Ron Paul. I really like a lot of what he says. You can't like everything, but I like a lot of what he says. I think he's going to have a hard time, but uh, I sort of, you know, really understand a lot of what he's saying. And a lot of what he's saying is not incorrect. At the Ron Paul headquarters in Des Moines, volunteers work the phones. It's a hub of activity, in contrast to the Iowa campaign offices of Mitt Romney, which was still closed at mid-morning. Paul is leaps and bounds ahead of Romney and Newt Gingrich in the ground game in Iowa, and it's now paying dividends. You know, one thing that's characteristic about our campaign is when people join our campaign, they rarely leave. Uh, they're real solid, determined supporters. They understand what the message is about, and they agree with that. So I think it's a very good sign, and I think uh, in, in political terms, it, it means that we're probably peaking at the right time. All supporters are not likely to sway in the political breeze. They eagerly eat up his message smaller government, fiscal discipline, and strict interpretation of the Constitution. Paul's support comes from a variety of passionate groups, the youth, Tea Party members, and homeschoolers, a group very politically active in Iowa. Conservative radio host Steve Day says Paul has a very good chance of pulling off an upset in the state. Organizationally, um, he's very well organized, has really a devoted following. He also has several people around the state, people that I know that have done a very good job for lack of a better word, evangelizing uh, the Ron Paul philosophy of governance. Paul has an authentic, folksy style that plays well not just in Iowa, but also with this breakfast crowd in a New Hampshire deli. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ron Paul's strategy includes wooing independents in Iowa, and they can take part in the caucuses. And if there is enough momentum coming out of Iowa, that could reshuffle the whole GOP field. Ron Paul will win. Ron Paul was killing it, knocking them down one by one. We wouldn't have a Federal Reserve system and we wouldn't be invading the privacy of every single individual in this country with bills like the Patriot Act. We'd have a free society and a prosperous society. Ron Paul 2012! Ron 
Paul is for real, Brooke, uh, bank on it. Can he win the Iowa caucuses? He has 20 days to prove that he can deepen and grow his organization. Will he be a factor in the Iowa caucuses? Absolutely. Uh, we are at the Iowa State University campus here. I just had a conversation over coffee with some students on campus, and the Ron Paul energy, the Ron Paul organizing, there's a Youth for Ron Paul organization on campus. When he came here to speak about a week ago, they couldn't fit any more people in the room. So he has this really fascinating mix of support. He has an older group of libertarians who have supported him for some time. Remember, Ron Paul was the libertarian candidate for president back in 1988. Uh, that's back in the day. Uh, he's run for the Republican nomination twice now. Uh, so he has an older base, and then he has this very energetic young base. They're active in social media. They organize online. Uh, trust me, they approach you on the street and say, why isn't Ron Paul getting more press coverage? Hmm. It's a well, actually, uh, Wolf, the governor believes that Ron Paul does have a clear possibility of winning uh, the Iowa caucuses. But as you might expect, he doesn't agree with the establishment because he thinks it would not affect the importance of Iowa. Take a listen to what he had to say. If Ron Paul wins, some Republicans are going to say, who cares about Iowa? Well, I, it's the, still the first test. And it's all test about being, what? it's the test of strength and, and who is the best. First of all, we've always said Iowa winnows the field. So you want to be in the top three. So, I, I, you know, it's, it's not only about who wins Iowa. How could we won Iowa last time? But, uh, uh, you know, it, it's also about, and um, obviously this is where Obama got his start. So. Uh, we want to be the state that not only launched Oham Obama, but sunk him. Well, so but, that's what our goal is. But so, Wolf, you can tell he's spinning here a little bit, as you might expect, saying that it's not only about winning, but it's also about who comes in second and third. And he does have a point here because uh, somebody who might surprise us and come in second or third, like a Rick Santorum, could really have uh, have some momentum. But again, he's not having any of it that Iowa isn't important. Why does the establishment, the, the big government Republicans, that would be all of them running against him, call him an isolationist? What, what does that conjure up? Well, because they don't want to have the discussion that Ron Paul is having with the Republican Party, that we're doing too much overseas, that we can't afford it. I'd like to point out this, you know, is Canada isolationist? Is Sweden isolationist? If a country is it everywhere in the world, all at one time, spending all this money, flexing its military muscle globally all at one time, does that mean they're isolationists? Well, America, you know, is probably doing too much right now. A lot of our military experts think that. A lot of our political experts, and we know we can't afford it. What? This notion that we can't talk about it, that we can't have a cost-benefit analysis on Afghanistan and Iraq, is not isolationist. Okay. It's a conversation the Republicans do not want to have. L let me pose this conversation to you. We wake up one morning and there's a Chinese fleet in New York Harbor and Ron Paul is president. What would he do? You'd would he look him. the other way? That is an act of war and you'd blow him out of the water. First of all, they shouldn't have got that far to begin with. There would have been some line out there in the okay. Atlantic Ocean. All right. that's I just what wanted happens. to give you the, the most frightful example. Well, that's right. And that's a, a common misperception. Ron Paul believes in a strong national defense. In fact, his budget provides for a, a military four times the size of China. I mean, we're talking about a large, strong national defense. But the question is, when do you use it? How often do you use it? Does it make sense when you use it? How much money are we spending? All right. Does, does Ron Paul agree with Admiral Mullen, the recently retired chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who said our greatest national security threat is the national debt? Stated differently, would he keep open the 900 military facilities that we have around the world? Absolutely not. There's a big difference, and Admiral Mullen was absolutely right, between a national defense, which Ron Paul supports strongly, and an irrational offense, which is a lot of what we do around the world today. All right. Ron Paul and Israel. Why is this controversial uh, in the Republican Party? I mean, Ron Paul is in favor of the right of every nation to defend itself. There was a time during the Iraq war in the, in the, uh, the Iraq-Iran uh, war in the, in the 80s when Ron Paul stood up for and defended Israel against the other Republicans, that's one of whom was Ronald Reagan. That's exactly right. And Ron Paul said repeatedly that Israel should be and always has been one of our best friends. You're talking about 1981, when right. Israel decided to uh, attack a nuclear reactor. And the entire United States Congress condemned Israel, except who? 
Ron Paul. He stood by Israel, the right to their own self-defense, and defended their sovereignty. It is up to that nation or any nation to, to do, do whatever it needs to. What has been the tradition of conservative Republicans in the Republican Party prior to the George W. Bush days about using the Defense Department for defensive purposes Well, if only? you go back to Robert Taft, you look at Barry Goldwater, you look at Ronald Reagan, it's to have a sober and realistic national defense. Ronald Reagan, for all these Republicans running for president saying they, they're Reaganites on foreign policy, we didn't have any prolonged wars under Ronald Reagan. We weren't in Iraq and Afghanistan for 10 years or anything like that, facing a menace far greater than anything we face today in the Soviet Union with nuclear weapons in our backyard. Much more, something much more worse to deal with. And yes, Ron Paul is closer to what Reagan believed in, Barry Goldwater, Robert Taft. It is the conservative Republican tradition to be sober in our foreign policy. Got it. My friends, you don't have to, uh, you don't need to do nation building in Israel. We're already built. <laughs> you don't need to export democracy to Israel. We've already got it. And you don't need to send American troops to Israel. We defend ourselves. A summation that's become a YouTube sensation. Who says Fox Business doesn't carry clout? Welcome, everybody. I'm Neil Cavuto. And just call it the beef that went viral. Because my closing comments last night on Ron Paul and just letting voters decide whether he's a serious candidate got some... Very serious reaction, thousands of hits, and apparently they just keep on coming and coming. And all because I refuse to continue this media piling on a candidate the mainstream media. And many of my own colleagues here at Fox say can't win. Well, that may be so. But as I said last night and mentioned with my colleague and friend Chris Wallace last week in Iowa, I'm the guy on the left, that is not up to us to decide. That is up to Iowans to decide. The final straw for me, when Iowa's governor had the gall to say, if Ron Paul wins his state, focus on who comes in second. Again, trivializing not only Ron Paul, but any candidate, I guess, by extension. The enlightened media or power brokers decide is not an acceptable candidate. Well, it certainly hit a chord. Robert May emails, thank you for not being an idiot. Sounds like one my mother-in-law could have written. Anyway, uh, Shannon Fitzpatrick emails, thanking you for defending Dr. Paul against the ridiculously biased attacks made by such pundits as Bill O'Reilly, Rachel Maddow, Chris Wallace, and Brian Williams. Some of those folks are very good, by the way, but as she continues, I haven't seen something like this in a very long time. Jeff via Yahoo, you have rhymes with walls of steel. I am a veteran and I salute you. Jeff emails. You're one of the few non-asses in the mainstream media landscape. You have consistently been fair and unbiased, and you have consistently delivered, including at the recent Fox News debate in Iowa. Virginia emails, while everyone everywhere is perfecting their smear campaign against Ron Paul and now preparing to discredit the Iowa caucus, it was just wonderful to see you call these people out on the nonsense. Justin emails, bravo, Neil, thank you so much for standing up and saying what needed to be said about the media's unethical treatment of who is electable and their automatic discrediting of Ron Paul. Russ Rolowski of Pennsylvania, I applaud your willingness to let the man speak his mind, even though you may not agree with him in total. Jordy Hutmels, you may not be a Ron Paul supporter, but you showed fair treatment and respect for him. For that, I would like to thank you immensely. We don't expect pundits and news presenters to support Dr. Paul. All we are looking for is fair treatment, and you have done so. Jim Brown emails, thanks, Neil. Paul's not perfect, but who is? He should at least be given a fair shake. That really sums it up. Of the thousands of emails we got on this subject, that was, it is my point. Ron Paul should be given a fair shake, a fair hearing. And if he wins Iowa, a fair pat on the back, not a swift dismissive kick in the ass. It is not up to the establishment politicians or knucklehead anchors like me to decide who's a credible candidate or not, even though I think, truth be told, I'm a pretty good judge. Anyway, as I said last night in this very show, our track record isn't really good if you think about it. Weren't these the same experts who were the ones saying Jimmy Carter's own upstart 1976 win in Iowa was a fluke, but it wasn't. Well, Ronald Reagan could never, ever, ever be elected president. But he was. Now, I'm not smart enough to figure how things will go this time, but I am smart enough to know how candidates constantly dismissed by their party pros respond almost every time. They leave. They just bolt. John Anderson in 1980. George Wallace in 1968. Teddy Roosevelt in 1912. 
each dismissed by a party that refused to hear their message, then compounding its ills by ripping the messenger. Now, I don't know what Congressman Paul does next, where he maybe wins next, where he goes next. I do know Republicans keep this dismissive attitude going. It wouldn't surprise me one bit if Ron Paul does this next. Just leave the party. Because for him, it hasn't been a party.